Tyler, oh, saturated buffers, Tyler. Come on. Did somebody say something? I'm sorry. No, not not necessarily. Okay. He did say something. Like they were talking yeah. about mugs. They were talking about, yeah, you're missing. Oh, we, we could send one in the mail, a coffee mug. Yes. Oh, man. Okay, Malcolm, we <laughs> oh, need to make sure we send, sure. we send Tyler a coffee mug. Yeah. Yes, I, I love coffee mugs. Okay, all right, an INRC coffee mug. You know, if you come in person, you get in the in the drawing for a coffee mug or you speak in person, but you know, to our speakers remotely, especially this semester, we need to get you all in. Yeah. All right. I think we'll we'll get started. It's close enough to 310. Thanks folks for, for coming um, in person or online for this month's Iowa Nutrient Research Center seminar uh, series. And so we are uh, fortunate to have with us first, uh, Dr. Tyler Groh. Uh, they got his PhD at uh, Iowa State University in Dr. Um, Eisenhart's lab and worked on, on saturated buffers. Uh, did some of the first research work uh, in the world um, on saturated buffers. And uh, he's moved on to Penn State University uh, assistant professor position. and so. He's going to talk about about the saturated buffers, how BMP accelerates water quality and career opportunities, and then um, after Tyler's done, we'll transition to Andrew Rupiper, that is a master's student currently with Dr. Billy Beck and, and working on the, some some things uh, here in Central Iowa on Beaver Dam. So uh, with that, um, uh, when Tyler's done, we can ask him a question or two, and then we'll turn it over to Andrew, and then. Uh, questions for Andrew and then for, for both of them, if, if Tyler's, as long as his computer hangs on. He said he got the news <laughs> of death five minutes before he got on, but hopefully everything hangs in there. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tyler. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I really appreciate it. It's a great honor. Um, yeah, let's hope that my technology will work. So far, so good. So... Um, as, as Matt did say, I'm at Penn State University. I'm in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. Um, and first, I wanted to go over a quick outline. Um, I was told to, to give a talk based on this outline, but I wanted to share with you all um, the outline as well. Um, and at first, we're going to go over a little introduction about myself and where I currently am, what my position is. Um, then we're going to transition to some major um, INRC-funded uh, research findings that I had at Iowa State University. And then uh, I will go into kind of how the INRC funded research really helped propel me into the career that I'm in um, today. So looking forward to giving this talk. My current position um, is an assistant research professor um, and a watershed management extension specialist at Penn State. 75% um, of my appointment is in Penn State Extension and 25% is in research. I'm housed at University Park, which is at State College in the central part of the state. Um, it's essentially the Ames location of, uh, of Pennsylvania, so dead center in the state. So it's really convenient to get to all, all portions of the Commonwealth. Uh, the, the, we're, today I have a couple of background about Penn State Extension and how we're kind of organized and I realize every extension agency is organized a little differently. We do have seven different units are called. Um, I myself are, am in the agronomy and natural resources unit, but you can see the other six units on the on the screen. Within the agronomy and natural resources unit, we are split up into teams. Um, you can see the eight teams here. Um, I myself am in the uh, water resources team. And this is not to say that we don't do cross team work. We do that a lot. Um, for instance, I'm, I'm helping give a webinar series with the forest and wildlife team, talk about watersheds and how forests impact watersheds here in Pennsylvania in January. Um, but we do a lot of programming within the team itself and um, we kind of help each other out to make sure we're reaching everybody um, across the Commonwealth. When I first started in the water resources team, we had three sub teams. Uh, they included drinking water, urban storm water and agricultural water. My primary appointment um, for, for that time was between urban storm water and ag water. Um, since then, we kind of broadened our scope. 
added a few more sub teams on. We also added team members on, which has been great. Um, I feel like the water team has retained and grown the most in the past three years. And so we added pond water, stream health, and youth education. Um, I myself am the sub team leader for the stream health sub team. And so right now, uh, my position is split between stream health, urban storm water, and agricultural water. And so I do programming in all three of those areas. As I said before, I also have a 25% research appointment. Um, and I took a picture of, of my lab here this past summer. Um, we have essentially the same group in the fall here, except for one person graduated. Um, uh, but we're hoping to add on three more students um, towards the end of the semester and um, early next semester. So in all pun intended, our lab is growing, uh, which is always great uh, for a research program. The sort of research that we do in my lab, uh, we cover any anywhere from shallow groundwater monitoring and riparian buffers, as you can see here on the left, um, to biochar application on concentrated flow path and agronomic systems, um, as you can see in the center. And we also do some stream health measurements, including um, sediment accumulation and greenhouse gas emissions from a local ag um, headwater stream here in Center County. And you can see the floating chambers that we've used to sample starting this fall um, in that picture on the right. All right, with that, I will transition to the INRC funded research that I did here at Iowa State University. Um, as Matt said, it's all revolves around saturated riparian buffers. And I'm sure all or most of us are familiar with saturated buffers, but I will just quickly go through it just so we're all on the same page. Um, as we know, the Midwest um, ag system is heavily drained and um, allowing us to remove that gravitational water out so farmers can get access to their field and have um, really good yields of um, mostly corn and soybean. And so conventional outlets for tile drainage look kind of like the picture on the left here where we get water flowing to our tile lines and that gets shunted to the stream or ditch that then flows down to the Mississippi, Gulf of Mexico, um, et cetera, et cetera. With that comes nutrients and things like that that can be lost um, through these systems. And so um, with that, a lot of the hydrology that used to be connected um, from the field um, into the buffer is now disconnected. Um, and the, that buffer is essentially not um, helping remove any nutrients that are in that shallow groundwater. And so um, a while back now, Dan James and Tom Eisenhardt came up with a simple but effective um, technique called a saturated buffer where um, you put a control box onto the, the, the main tile line here. You run additional distribution pipe parallel to the stream itself. You can raise the water table up in the control structure, which raises the, the shallow groundwater in the buffer. And we end up with um, getting nutrient removal with um, vegetation uptake, as well as microbial processes. One such microbial process for um, nutrient removal, specifically nitrate, is denitrification. Uh, one of the main questions going into my work here at Iowa State in, in 2014 was we knew that these systems were removing nitrates to varying degrees, but how was it being removed? Um, and so the theory was either, you know, vegetation uptake, denitrification would be the major two forms of nitrate removal. Um, and just to kind of go over what um, denitrification is, Quickly, before we get into some of the results, um, it's the conversion of nitrate uh, to dinitrogen gas, um, hopefully, and sometimes to nitrous oxide, it, it can happen. In order to have that process supported, I think of it as a four-legged stool. Uh, we need four things for sure to, to occur in our soil in order for that uh, process to be supported. And that's nitrate, anaerobic conditions, so um, lacking oxygen, organic carbon, as well as microbial communities. So we need the microbial communities to do this effort. They munch on their organic carbon and then use nitrate um, as a respiration source um, to um, breathe in essentially nitrate and breathe out um, dinitrogen gas. And so that's why we cannot have oxygen in our systems. Otherwise they would not be favoring nitrate over um, other um, terminal electron acceptors. All right, and with that, uh, we wanted to take a bunch of different soil cores throughout um, three different saturated buffers, and so we did that with a um, 
hydraulic Giddings probe. As you see here in the um, top left picture, we took soil cores down to 100 centimeters and sometimes a little bit more than that. Um, and then we divided up the soil core into 20 centimeter sections. We capped each of them with uh, SEPTA, put a settling gas in them, and we're able to use the settling inhibition method, which stops that last step of the denitrification process, allows us to collect all the denitrification gases as nitrous oxide. And we're able to then measure the total amount of denitrification that occurs in each one of these sections. This being part of a saturated buffer, these soils were saturated uh, with water, and therefore there could have been some dissolved nitrous oxide in that pore water. And so we had to take each one of these um, cores after they were done in an incubation um, chamber, put them into mason jars, shake them around and get all the, um, or most of the, the gases out, or at least equilibrate with the headspace, take the nitrous oxide sample and determine how much um, the nitrous oxide was dissolved in the, in the pore water as well. And so the, the combination between those two steps was the total um, in situ denitrification rate. And some of the results from that study are on the screen here. I do want to quickly point out that this is all published in the Journal of Environmental Quality, and this paper was awarded the 2021 Outstanding Paper um, Award. And this is not to float my own boat at all, but just um, as a token of gratitude, because I realized, you know, as a student at Iowa State University, I would never have had this outstanding paper if not supported by great faculty members, mentors, um, and, and, and the such, and having a great um, lab as well to, to work with. So um, thank you all so much for making that happen. And this award has been for great to um, springboard my career um, where I'm at. And so um, to get into the results a little bit, uh, we have denitrification rate here on the y-axis up top. And um, all the graphs up top are the in situ denitrification rates per date, as you see here on the x-axis. The U's above the bars stand for when the buffer was not saturated, so when there was no tile drainage water in the buffer itself. And you can see here, um, sometimes, for most buffers actually, there, the highest denitrification rate that we got was when the buffer was not saturated. Um, so when there was you know, open pore space um, filled with air, things like that, um, all except for um, BC2. So that was very interesting. Another interesting component that we found is if we look down below, uh, we see here that when we stack up the, um, the percent um, of the total denitrification rate that each of those 20 centimeter sections um, accounted for, we can see that the, the top portion, so basically the red and the yellow, sort of the 20 to um, 60 centimeters, that it accounted for 50% or more of the denitrification rate. So if you take 50%, go across the board, um, but those top two sections accounted for 50% or more of the total rate in the majority of cases. Not necessarily all the time, but in the majority of cases, saying that, hey, we are getting the most denitrification um, in that top section, um, and therefore, obviously, trying to raise the water up as high as possible in our saturated buffers to get maximum denitrification rate. We also want to look at cumulative denitrification. And so we did that for each of these uh, three saturated buffers again. Uh, to quickly run through all the lines here, I know there's a lot to process here in a short bit of time, um, but we have um, a, our um, cumulative nitrate or tile nitrate load. So the total amount of nitrate coming out of the field in the dark um, black line here, that solid black line up top, we then have our red line is the amount of nitrate that was diverted, so that actually entered the saturated buffer. The blue line is how much nitrate was removed by the saturated buffer, and the green line, the solid green line here, is really how much um, to, uh, total denitrification we have, so cumulative denitrification. Um, since denitrification rates are highly variable, as you can imagine, anybody who actually does any denitrification work um, knows that these rates can be highly variable. Um, so uh, I also put in a 90% confidence interval, uh, which is that green shaded area. And um, we're able to see with that confidence interval that denitrification can account for uh, the total amount of nitrate removed 
in BC1 for both years. So it definitely um, is greater than the, the blue line for both years. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for BC2, um, which was a newly planted buffer. So it was planted just before it was installed as a saturated buffer in 2015. And it's also not the case for IA1 in, in year two, but it was the case for year, year one. So um, it, it, it got us thinking that there might be some sort of um, factors that are um, kind of hindering denitrification. We really wanted to see what was um, stopping it from, from reaching its potential. And so we came up with um, a set of denitrification uh, potential experiments. And for this denitrification potential um, portion, we realized that we don't want to um, we don't want to alter anaerobic conditions too much because we want it to be somewhat similar to the conditions out in the field, kind of what the in situ um, experiments were. We also didn't want to add any microbial communities too because we just want to test those that are there. Um, so what we did is we figured out we could alter um, how much nitrate is available to those microbial communities as well as how much organic carbon is available. And so we um, came up with this denitrification potential experiment where we took the mason jar from our in situ experiment, separated the four mason jars as equally as we could. Um, we had a control with just water. We had one jar where we added nitrate, one jar where we added dextrose, so simple sugar, so simple carbon for the microbes to use, and then a jar where we added nitrate and dextrose for our total maximum denitrification potential. Took an initial sample, incubated it into a second sample. The difference between second and first is how much total denitrification happened in that um, incubation time. And so the results um, are shown here on the screen where we have denitrification potential on the y-axis, temperature on the x. And we can see here that just comparing maximum denitrification potential, so those jars that had nitrate and carbon both added, that BC1, uh, both the grass portion of the buffer as well as the woody portion that had the silver maples, was well greater, especially in the higher temperatures, um, so getting past 20 degrees Celsius, than our newly established buffer that was directly upstream from BC1. Um, our, we hypothesize that this could be because it's a newly planted buffer, vegetation hasn't really had a chance to take root, um, less labile carbon, things like that for the, the microbes to use. We also saw that um, when we looked at the total portion of the maximum denitrification potential that each of the treatments um, um, that each of the treatments were responsible for, we can see that nitrate and carbon kind of took off terms be, being more favorable to reach that um, maximum denitrification potential for BC1. But really, BC2, that younger buffer, anything below the, the surface horizon here, uh, or surface layer, we see that the simple sugar, that simple dextrose, was really the most important factor to reaching our um, total maximum denitrification potential. So um, really indicating, once again, that this um, buffer is carbon limited, potentially because it's so new. All right, and then real quickly here, um, during my postdoc while at Iowa State, I also got the opportunity to be an engineer for a week or two. Um, it's the only time in my life that I ever claimed to be close to being an engineer, and I've never claimed it since. Um, but I do ex I do appreciate the experience here. Um, I got to design a, a, a new saturated buffer design that uh, looked at having two laterals put in instead of just one, uh, so two distribution pipes instead of one. Um, and that, we'll quickly walk you through this um, design, we have the main line coming from the field here, going into the main control structure, that shunts water out to two uh, four-chamber control boxes that measures flow with a V-notch weir. And just to, um, second, to have a second source of flow measurement, we do have the flow going into a, a, um, a linear PVC pipe with flow totes. So once again, get another flow measurement and then that gets um, sent out to the laterals. Um, as with all saturated buffer designs, we do also have a overflow option where water can flow back to the main box and out to the stream under really high flow conditions. And this is the design on paper. This is it in real life when it was put in um, back in 2019, I believe. Um, and 
yeah, so once again, this is the main control box. These are the two small four chambers, and these are the flow totes and these longer PVC pipes that then get sent out to, to those dual distribution lines. Um, and so the data is still being collected on these, and it's being worked on by the Eisenhardt group, and including Gabriel Johnson. So we got some great minds on it, and hopefully they'll have some um, results very soon. With that, I just want to quickly um, say how all this work, especially the IRC funded research really helped propel my career. Um, and this really should not be understated. Um, uh, my time here at Iowa State spent, you know, researching saturated buffers. Um, it really gave me an applied science um, background that I could easily help out with extension and outreach events. Um, I was involved with the Iowa Watershed Academy, the Farm Progress Show in 2016, Camp Side, the State Fair one year, um, as well as I got to help out with the design of drainage water quality practices um, a couple years, um, specifically focusing on um, saturated buffer siting and design. Um, and so that really sparked my interest in, in um, extension and outreach and really got me interested in the position um, that I'm in today. Also, um, through the Eisenhart Lab, I'm sure anybody who, maybe in the field or in, in, the, in the room right now or online who was a part of the Eisenhart Lab at one time or is now to understand that we do um, have lots of um, opportunities to be involved with field days. Um, this one is a picture from when a, a bunch of bloggers came through and wanted to learn about water quality in the Midwest. And so I got to go out there and speak to them at one of our saturated buffer locations about what saturated buffers are and what we've been finding, which is another great opportunity. I was able to use that experience to kind of uh, formulate and um, help grow the biochar research program that I have at Penn State. Um, and so I was able to um, directly link up with uh, forest, the, the forest company um, called Metzler's, who, who makes um, the biochar that we use for the experiment. Um, and then also get to look at the conservation practice standard that's currently around for um, biochar, which is basically just a soil carbon amendment. It doesn't have anything to do with water quality yet. So figuring out how we can test um, biochar to potentially get um, it being considered as a water quality practice. Um, then um, through you know, past experiment experiences, I realized, you know, I have to form partnerships with um, agencies as well as landowners. And so forming them with Center County Conservation District, as well as Chesapeake Bay Foundation, I was able to find some great landowners to work with. Um, it was able to find funding through the McIntyre Stennis um, program. And then um, got to um, install these plots on um, private land. All of our research, um, this biochar project, as well as other projects in the Grow Lab happen on private land. That's how I've always was always brought up in my graduate career, and that's how I'm going forward with it. Um, it's great to see um, their interest with it and get, be able to share results with the landowners as well. And then I'm 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 passing it on, um, uh, passing the baton on to the next generation here. Um, here's a picture of my grad student um, showing a bunch of high schoolers who are interested in water quality from the governor's school in the summertime um about our experiment at um, the biochar plots and what we're doing to measure infiltration there and so with that um, i know there's whirlwind but thank you so much and i can handle any questions thanks so much tyler uh any questions either if you if you are online and have a question just raise your hand if you can kind of call it <coughs> No questions. Okay, I'm okay we'll get, with that too. You're okay with that too. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll transition because maybe somebody will think of one. Okay, yeah. we are going to. Uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and Andrew, if you want to come up and share yours, we'll see if we can get this set up. He found out that our computer here in Ealing's Hall uh, was not um, adequate for his. Here we go. Okay. We'll, uh, just... Here we go. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tyler. Good to see you virtually at a distance. Apparently, if you work in the Eisenhart Beck Pete Moore lab, you have to lose all of your hair, grow some <laughs> facial hair for a couple of days. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the water in science too, but you should probably look Ooh. into that. Uh, like Matt and the others said, I'm going to talk a little bit about beaver dams today. 
been a, about a two, two and a half year uh, ramp up to this point. We're really just at the finish line right now. Uh, I'm in the process of finishing the data collection, getting ready to continue to write. You know, some soil samples are sitting at places as we waited until farmers were sampling as well, but that's how it goes. Uh, so I'm Andrew Rupiper. I'm a master's student currently with Dr. Billy Beck, again, in that kind of Eisenhart, Pete Moore uh, family tree over there in Enra. Other collaborators on this project. Uh, in the room here, we've got Dr. Andy Craig, uh, Keith Schilling over at the University of Iowa, IIHR, Iowa Geology, whatever other appointments he's gotten in the last couple of days. Tyler is a, a affiliated member, and then Pete Moore, kind of fluvial geomorphologist. And then uh, uh, Grandpa Dick Schultz is kind of leading the way uh, with a lot of his ideas. Uh, so we have collaborators in our work. We have collaborators in our lives. I thought I'd share a few of mine. Uh, this is my wife, Abby. She was actually over at the vet school today giving a talk, trying to recruit new vet students to come work for her. Uh, she's the medical director at Iowa Veterinary Specialists, the emergency clinic down in Des Moines. This is a daily occurrence, getting some sort of weird lizard picture. She does a lot of exotics. And we've got two of my furry collaborators and companions, uh, Wicked on the left, the monster Newfoundland. And Sally K. Ride, mission specialist. I give all my dogs strange names because my wife's employees have to type them in every time I go into the work. Uh, so that's Sally K. Ride up there on the right in your chair. I've got some human collaborators as well. Uh, these are my children, uh, some adopted, some not. I'll let you guess. Rosie on the left there doing some bird watching at daycare the other day. I about cried and had to go home when I saw that picture. It was uh, pretty, pretty happy to see they were emulating what their parents do. So that's what her uh, vision of me is, I suppose. Got a little read in the middle, filling up the flume down in Andy's lab. Do not tell EHNS. He is not certified to use anything. <clears throat> Just water. And then my my newly adopted son, Calvin uh, Ba. He's a, a Ghanaian from well, from Ghana, as you can imagine. Uh, graduate student in my program as well. I kind of took him into our family. We love having him around and my kids uh, as well. And I have a 13 year old. This is her natural habitat. Sleeping, sleeping, <laughs> sleeping, okay. sleeping. I'm <laughs> sure she will kill me when she sees this later today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her habitat's the back seat of a vehicle. Uh, I started my academic career at the Community College of the Air Force, so I like to tell people. There is a real Community College of the Air Force that I have some kind of AA degree from, but really it's experienced the world. I've uh, been to now 147 different countries, uh, six deployments, both combat and fun. Uh, it's really good times. Got to fly around in F-16s a couple times, uh, worked for the Consulate General in Afghanistan, built a lot of I guess, snowmen in the Middle East. And I lived in places like this, little tents, rockets coming in. I love being here at Iowa State, none of those pressures. Uh, transitioning back into the civilian world, I went to Drake University down in Des Moines, worked both in the kind of ethnobotany world, looking at how Native Americans influenced uh, specifically genetics of Diosporus virginiana, the American persimmon. And then uh, one of my mentors, now a family friend, uh, working with ornate box turtles, Blanding's turtles, habitat suitability. Graduated from there and needed to make a little money. So I went and took a job at DuPont Pioneer as a research scientist. Um, kind of a weird deal. I was an environmental science bachelor's degree holder in a PhD position in genetics. I got a C in genetics at Drake. Didn't tell them that on the interview. But really, they hired me, I think, because I like to solve problems. Uh, some of you in the room have maybe had some problems that I've solved recently. That is where I get my satisfaction from. This place let me solve all kinds of problems. Uh, working in a corporate environment gets a little wonky sometimes, layoffs, whatever, whatever, led me back uh, to pursue some more school. This is now my happy place. Uh, I generally look like that, sometimes look like this, but either way, you're going to find me in a beaver dam, irrespective of whether I'm researching them or not. They're just cool places. You find all kinds of birds, bugs, the stuff that we as ecologists and animal science people really enjoy. But I'm tasked now with trying to chase some of the agricultural, the kind of non-living problems that we are dealing with. Today, we're gonna to be on the Des Moines Lode. It's that recently glaciated landform that all of us have heard a lot about. That's where Iowa State's campus is. A uh, beautiful part of the state that has been super modified over the years. I don't need to go into exactly why and where, uh, as you can imagine. I do really like this picture. Dr. Bradley Miller, uh, Bill Crumpton, some of those guys over in the EEOB and agronomy world have produced some pretty neat GIS uh, work looking at Iowa's past historical land use. It was wetlands under the mine load everywhere. Beavers are contributing to a lot of that, to be honest. Uh, so both wetlands and beavers were lost at the same period of time. Uh, beavers through trapping, wetlands through tile drainage. Uh, channelization and just general conversion. Uh, so most of my sites are on this Altamont uh, till plain. We've got a few down in the Bemis. 
for all intents and purposes, what we're doing, they're effectively the same place um, when it comes to sediment trapping and the like. I like to use this little graphic. I was not a water quality person, wetland person before I got here to Iowa State. So I'm like, why does this stuff matter? Well, I don't like my house being flooded. Neither do these people in this little infographic. So it helps me illustrate back in the day, we get a big rain event, it found its way into the landscape, whereas now it's being shunted downstream for flooding our infrastructure. A lot of words here, we'll just focus on the underlying ones. There's like six of those. So really what I'm trying to do with this portion of the study uh, around beavers is to quantify and characterize what the heck they're trapping. They're trapping all, you walk behind a beaver dam, Chris, some of you guys in the room have done it with me. It's hard work. You're waist deep sometimes in some sludgy, stinky, you know, effluent, uh, lovely stuff that I really enjoy getting in and feeling and sniffing, but most of my students are ready to go to the laundry to mat afterwards, looking at the Des Moines Low. So basically how much and what's in it behind the beaver dam. We like to compare that across dams, different landscape positions, but really we're trying to look at efficiency here. You've got X amount of sediment being delivered, how much is being trapped, what's the ratio between the two? And then other patterns. So within that beaver dam pool, how are these sediments kind of segregated spatially and then how do they change over time? Um, time is the big one here that I think uh, differentiates us from most states out west. Got a couple of fun maps here, not super informative. They are in two different scales, please don't hit me. Uh, really what I wanna exemplify here is this Caton Branch site. We're working from about 350 to 250 roughly meters up and down a relatively small watershed. Contrast that with this Smeltzer site here, much larger watershed, what, four or five times uh, the size, but a lot less relief, very flat uh, landscape there. Reason, uh, Caton Branch is situated right in that Des Moines River Valley. That thing's been incising for some time. Uh, one of the few Iowa river valleys that we really have uh, in this glaciated landscape. Only other primary difference I'd point out here is the ag percentage. So Caton Branch with that topography and just some of the, the land being owned by state and federal agencies, it's not nearly uh, Iowa standard for uh, ag percentage. We're down into that 78-ish, whereas Smeltzer is a pretty standard Iowa landscape, 90 plus percent uh, agricultural. Similar precipitation over the study period, similar heavy rain events. Uh, those are in inches at the end there. Smelter site, again, flat. We can actually see some of the rows of corn and LIDAR imagery here. That's just how flat this place is. Little valley here with some natural levees, some man-made levees. Uh, it's very channelized when we get up in the reach. Um, this is a site that the Ann Smelter Charitable Trust has left behind for intentional conservation research, uh, all kinds of cool saturated buffers, bioreactors, you name it. If something's going on at Iowa State, they probably have a spot uh, on this little um, couple acres of farm that, that exists here. Primary beaver dam that we are interested in studying has been there for quite some time. We can see it in old aerial imagery, probably 10, 15, 20 years. That's somewhat rare for Iowa. Uh, we get these really flashy hydrologic events that tend to blow these things out and at least relocate them in the landscape. Uh, this one's made up predominantly of obviously sticks, uh, but a lot of cobbles that beavers will roll up, you know, think bowling ball sized stones, uh, as well as a whole boatload every year of corn stalks. These guys will clear out an acre of corn in a night, stick it in their dam. They like to eat it, that provides good structure uh, for their building. We're going to contrast that. We've got a wide river valley here, wide relative uh, to most in Iowa. That stream meanders pretty actively through that river valley. So beavers are constantly chasing uh, moving water. We're also able to engage that floodplain pretty well here, we being the beavers and their work. Uh, but anytime you've got uh, high activity when it comes to your precipitation, you're probably gonna have some issues when it comes to maintaining a dam. Uh, pretty intuitive, this first dam here, our original study dam was there for almost 20 years until I got here and then it broke. Of course, like that's how science works. So we just adapt and overcome, we find another dam, Guess what? It lasted for one year, broke. Found another dam, lasted for one year, broke. Now, uh, normally be kind of upset, but we use that as an opportunity to say, okay, well, we've now examined three dams in a location, how much sediment's behind them, so on and so forth. And we're always bounding this study area with something way above and way below, so we can see the effect of all the beaver dams that might be in there. If you walk about a stream kilometer or two uh, through this valley, you're gonna run into, at some points in the summer, 25 beaver dams. They tend to have a primary dam. They're really kind of living in and occupying, but they're going to continue to dam streams if woody resources are available and they just want to 
have a pool to swim around. Beavers do not operate well over land. They like that stagnant water and they can create the big pools in a place like this. Get a lot of words, apologies, but really the kind of the talicized stuff at the top there, I'm gonna talk about fine mobile sediments. It's kind of something I had to somewhat make up. I mean, it's sediment that's relatively fine that's mobile, okay? So really we're talking about that material that is fluvially derived rather. So it's coming from a stream. A lot of it uh, is being eroded locally in the channel. It's not a ton of it uh, coming overland. Uh, that's some of Billy Beck's work, INRC stuff that uh, if you kind of look back in the literature, a lot of this stuff is still sized. So we're talking like 1.2 to 1.4 grams per centimeter cubed. Scale that up to a couple of grams on the screen here. It's got phosphorus in it. So as we're trapping sediment, we're trapping phosphorus. That's where the INRC comes in, is interested uh, in the sediment aspect. Uh, it's not homogenous. There's all kinds of bands of sand and depositional processes going on here, I realize. Uh, we're just looking to get a relatively accurate assessment of how much of this stuff is behind a dam at a certain point in time and what's in it. Frequently, I picked this image intentionally because so there's that stuff I'm interested in, that really stinky, carbon-rich, dark stuff there. We had a big rain event that actually overtopped all of that with sand. So we get this kind of banding effect uh, from time to time, especially as you kind of move up and down the stream in the Beaver Dam pool. So while we're out poking around, I'll show you that in a second. We also try to grab uh, tubes of sediment for a couple purposes. One being a similar uh, actually analysis to what Tyler was describing, where we're trying to look at nitrate removal efficiency uh, of these, these sediment columns. Perfect contrasting example here. We've got a reference reach. So that's that site outside of Beaver Dam influence. You'll see a little film of those fine mobile sediments on the top there. And really a lot of the denitrification is happening in that upper portion of the matrix. Uh, but this guy here on the right uh, is a freestanding column of this highly cohesive uh, silt-like material. So there's no tube holding that up. It's just sitting on a pipe in. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, so right now, as I was describing earlier, we've got some samples that are both in route and sitting on a desk somewhere at Midwest Labs. Uh, for a number of parameters, particle size, organic matter, phosphorus of various species. So what do we do? We go out, put on a very appealing outfit such as this. I have a assistant. This is Angel Brown here, uh, undergraduate over in the NREM department. Wonderful young lady, been a great help. Uh, we set up transects. Transects are the name of the game. And uh, the Eisenhart lab, when it comes to getting in the stream, it's a tape measure across the river. It allows us to find our place kind of laterally. We're taking those every 10 meters up and down, both the dam pool and the reference reach. Really, we're just poking at dirt with a stick. It's not that much more technologically fancy than that. Uh, we've got a tile probe with some graduations on it. And this is really what we're after on the right here is what is that depth at a given point of this fine mobile sediment? You feel as you press through it, a transition into that sand layer. You kind of know, okay, Water surface top of sediment, water surface to bottom of sediment, the difference is how much sediment is there. I always like to just dump everything into R and see what happens first. So at first effort, I was kind of shocked to see we had about 4,000 probe points throughout two years. That's a lot of standing in a stream and poking up and down. Uh, each year we did three or four events at two sites, but that's a pretty quick steer you away from some of the more exotic stuff on the right there, but we want to see, okay, there are zeros in both places. There are areas in a dam pool as well as the stream proper that do not have this fine mobile sediment. Overlaying them, look at the max. Oh, okay, they're relatively similar. We've got some points in the reference reach that are up in that same range as uh, the dam pool area. Really, it's the mean that differentiates. So all the red here are points behind the dams. All the blue are points in the reference reach. There's some overlap, but definitely a, a predominance for that dam depth. So when we start to look at the big kind of aggregate, uh, each of these points that exist on these box plots is a singular event where we went out and we characterized a per meter square mass of this stuff. Yellow dam, green reference, as you would have probably imagined, you stick a dam in a stream, guess what? Stuff builds up behind it, pretty intuitive. It's nice to kind of get some numbers to this though. Uh, a huge amount of this research has been done in Colorado, Washington, California, those places are nothing like Iowa. Relief is different. Those are bed load dominated versus suspended load dominated systems. So really it's hard to make the comparison. 
When we split it out by year, however, we start to notice, like, okay, we've got some of these wonky outliers of this one site at least. I'll try to explain those. In the springtime or post dam break are those events. So what I'm positing right now is that over winter and into the spring, we get high flow every year. That's why farmers wait to plant. That's why uh, when you go you know, canoeing in May, you might have some unexpected uh, conditions. So really these are the first of the year going in that sediment has been removed over that transition from year one to year two. As the summer goes along, it finds its way to a kind of an equilibrium. Those reference reaches staying roughly in the same area year to year as far as uh, this density goes. I like to visualize these things. Uh, we've got a beaver dam, we've got a distance from the dam upstream, and we've got a volume at each of those points. So really, we're just looking at dam sediment on the left, reference sediment on the right. So if you think of that as each of those as a stream, what are we accumulating behind those? Normally, we would expect to see a wedge shape where adjacent to the dam, highest level of deposition, and then as you kind of move upstream, you taper down into some sort of general wedge. We do see some uh, different results here at Smelter. Really, that's a super straight channel. And so I think what we're perceiving in some cases kind of upstream here is actually just natural pools that are being filled by the low velocity of a dam pool. Uh, it's just not migrating down to the dam proper. Beavers also excavate uh, immediately adjacent to the dam. They bring up all this material every night and pack it along the top of their dam to make it nice and watertight. Pretty, pretty uh, intuitive critters. These I always throw in just as like, uh, hey, what are we even talking about when we're looking at flow here? On the left, that's a normal spring beaver dam in Iowa. Very few of them persist in their current state year to year to year. Unless there's some sort of other method for that water to be shunted around them or maybe skip a meander, they're gonna break. Now, the beavers will fix them. Uh, that same dam was probably fixed a week later. They work fastidiously to stop that water. They hate the sound of water. But most of the year on the right, when we're in baseball conditions, which the last two years, if anybody pays attention to the rain, has been optimal, <laughs> uh, we sit at this kind of steady state. A uh, lot less turbidity coming through the dam, uh, as well as just generally a lot more stagnant pool, kind of equal velocity profile, whereas the, the high velocity is coming through the middle of that broken dam, just pulling a lot of sediment with it. Very quick. Spend a second on this hydrology. So we're looking at the end of 2021, all of our 22 and 23 years. Guess what? We had some dams break in 2022. There's my threshold for, this is a very approximate uh, time where we're gonna see those stages come and correspond with the velocity that would be expected to shear off some of that silt. It's just about every rain event over an inch. So we see a lot of resetting intra and interannually uh, with these settlements behind these dams. So really, uh, a lot of this is going to be tied back to our ability to track these things in time and space. So we went out, we put all kinds of sensors, we got a cool pressure transducer-based system in here. You can see all the silt kind of downstream from where we were walking in the dam pool while we were working. Spent about two days setting this up, and guess what? Two days and five inches of rain later, that dam is gone. We found uh, all the tubes and sensors a couple hundred yards downstream, had to rebuild, reset. But although that blew that dam out, up in the landscape, up in that 10 acres that was inundated at one point in time during this dam's persistence, you've got sites like this. You can go in and shear it off with a shovel and you'll find a centimeter, 10 centimeters in some cases of uh, sediment that's left up on that floodplain that won't remobilize unless we get some other uh, major rain event. Um, that's kind of the, the pan view, if you will. I know today this dam was not rebuilt, but there are all kinds of trees, shrubs, you name it, forbs that are popping back up in that was presumably some pretty rich uh, stuff that, that was left behind. So like I said before, we're at the tail end of this whole thing. Uh, really, I'm excited to have both this sediment and kind of the water quality arm of this, this study. Water quality is gonna be more focused on nitrate, uh, uh, soluble forms of phosphorus, just general sediment moving through the channel. Um, so really, we're kind of in that state of write a little bit, wait for a result to come in. Hopefully, you don't have to change the writing that I've just did kind of thing. Um, but looking to defend in spring of 2024, at least in regard to the masters. 
And much to the chagrin, I'm sure, of the administrative people in both my and the agronomy department, I've taken a quarter time appointment while simultaneously finishing my master's. I know I am a glutton for punishment um, with uh, Mike Castellano in the Castellano lab, continuing to work with Andy Craig down in his flume. That's this is flume Andy's baby right here that I just filled with 12,000 pounds of dirt. Super exciting. Uh, we're looking at nitrous oxide emissions, potentially some methane, uh, and, and just being able to kind of put some numbers to as we modulate drainage water in a system uh, and we can modulate how much nitrate we're inter introducing to that matrix as well, uh, what, what happens? So we've got these five like or long-term sensors that run into a data logger. And this is fresh off the presses yesterday. We've got nitrate, or excuse me, nitrous oxide fluxes actively happening um, as we're currently running the machine downstairs. I just love watching this thing happen, so I'll throw it on a loop. <laughs> it's kind of a satisfying end to what was hopefully a decent little talk here. This, none of this, to include the PhD work, you name it, the teaching that I've gotten to do, would have happened without INRC funding this project. I probably would not be at Iowa State had Billy not put a posting out for a beaver expert of sorts. Uh, and really, I've learned a ton. Actually, I'm going to be teaching an environmental science class at the women's prison in Mitchellville in the spring. So all of that thanks in some way, shape, or form to INRC and their willingness to let me go run around and poke at beaver dams, I guess. If there's any questions, I'm just going to let this run for a second. I will be taking a tour downstairs very briefly after this talk to Andy Craig's lab. Don't touch anything or lick your fingers afterwards. It's kind of dirty right now, but uh, it's where we'll be able to take a look at this, maybe get a little uh, thoughts about any questions about that specific unit downstairs. But I uh, appreciate you guys' time. Great. You know, interesting to see. And I think one thing is that I was wondering, like, if these things get blown out, do we just remove all the benefits? But it sounded like some of that stays there. It's so a big pulse of sediment, yeah. but I'm sure it's not ideal. Yeah. But in the long run, some of it legacy up on the yeah. 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 Okay. But questions before you run away? Yeah. Uh, Andy. Quick one. Uh, you just showed me that uh, like or you know, <laughs> earlier today. But yeah. Was it was like 10 times atmospheric. Nice so what we it, don't have any nitrate in the case. This is dirt. Yeah. So there's probably legacy N just in that right. sediment. I mean, we brought six so tons in. Yeah. So presumably as we kind of wet it dry, wet it dry, we resolubilize some things that were otherwise just kind of in that soil crust, if you will. Uh, I'm guessing this is a bit of an over uh, assessment here that I was showing earlier, those those crazy spikes. But really those are fluxes in a two minute period. Yeah, I mean, I we're gonna drive a lot of nitrous oxide. Right yeah, so. so I think the the big thing to remember there is, as long as we're able to scale all of the pieces of the puzzle in concert together, we should hopefully perceive the same ratio as we would see in nature. I always wonder too if we're okay. We brought sediment in from a field that it undergoes. Uh, kind of certain temperature variability throughout the year and by depth, we put it inside. So we're kind of removing some of that temperature limitation like Tyler's work, you look at as temperature goes up, so does denitrification potential. Uh, so we're probably have some, we're, we're looking at like optimal denitrification in 72 degree basement of Sukup Hall rather than 50 degree at 20 inches in, you know, Hain, Heinz Farm, wherever we pull this stuff from. All right, that's just a little tidbit of your presentation. Yeah, <laughs> that you have a vested interest in. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's exciting stuff that I hope you and I can continue to figure out. Are there other questions for Andrew or Tyler? Oh, okay, and we're going to do a drawing for the coffee mug. Andrew gets one. He gave a Tyler does too. It's just he has to wait for. Here. So, okay, I'm going to have Dr. Eisenhart you take, you take the uh, Patricia. All right. Oh, thank you. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. 
Thanks everybody for uh, attending today. Thank you, Tyler and, and Andrew for uh, excellent presentations and tune in next month. Remind me, Kay or Malcolm or Ann, who do we have next month? Uh, oh, Elliot Anderson. Yes. From, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. We got, we have that one month that we have to move. So we'll be on the third floor for our last one uh, of, of this semester. Oh, okay. And um, you got to get them in quicker. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you come up with the idea for your research project? Or was it something that, um, you know, was handed to you? I'll jump in quick, Tyler. There was actually another student that started my project. Um, young lady got six months in and had some life decisions to make and went elsewhere. I was actually the second choice the first time around. So I was teaching special ed down at Ankeny Centennial. Billy calls me in a panic on a Thanksgiving, and I'm here six weeks later. So it was kind of nice in that somebody did the pilot work for me. <laughs> I won't complain, but it was always kind of tricky to balance. I didn't make any of these decisions. Why are we doing this with, okay, this is what we're doing today. So, yeah. Tyler, how about, how about you? Also the question, okay, so um, for the, the work that we did, um, the in situ part was, was already planned as part of a, a grant already. The um, the potential kind of came as a question along the lines of like, you know, we, we're seeing denitrification limitations, so we should add this potential experiment onto it. So that was kind of um, formulated on the spot. So that was kind of developed in the moment. All right, with that, let's thank our speakers once again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for, for those online and uh, tune in next month. All right. Bye bye. If you guys want to follow Andy and I downstairs, feel free. Uh, we're just going down the big staircase here back into the corner.